do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another installation of Horizon Lodge's Thalamic Arts series of classes. Tonight's class is Shimmering Chaos, the Magical Power of Art. I am Intelikaya. My website is lapis-mercurii.org. There you can find articles, blog posts, audio and video of my classes and presentations, as well as my visual creations. You can also find me on Facebook as Frauder and Telekaya. I am giving tonight's talk on behalf of Horizon Lodge Ordo Templi Orientis in Seattle, Washington. You can find us at seattle-oto.org. While tonight's class, along with all of our content, is free, we kindly ask for your help so that we can continue to bring you this content and to maintain our temple space in Seattle. You may PayPal donations to us using the email address horizon at seattle-oto.org. We very much appreciate your generosity. One of the most important statements Crowley made on the subject of art production is in chapter 20 of Magic and Theory and Practice, titled, Of the Eucharist and of the Art of Alchemy. Nearly as an aside to a broader discussion of alchemy and various forms of magic, Crowley states, once again, there is nothing in this exclusively magical. Rembrandt van Rijn used to take a number of ores and other crude objects. From these he banished the impurities and consecrated them to his work by the preparation of canvases, brushes, and colors. This done, he compelled them to take the stamp of his soul. From those dull, valueless creatures of earth, he created a vital and powerful being of truth and beauty. It would indeed be surprising to anybody who has come to a clear comprehension of nature if there were any difference in the essence of these various formulas. The laws of nature apply equally in every possible circumstance. From a purely naturalistic perspective, paint is merely some pigmented liquid, liquefiable or solid mastic composition which, after application with a stick, a brush, or fingers, converts to a solid film on a surface. And yet, though they are dealing with such humble, crude materials, as Crowley put it, the artist is able to create something from them which expresses vitality power, truth, and beauty. While Crowley's statement focuses solely on the medium of paint, the same claim could be made of other forms of art, such as sculpture, film, photography, poetry, or prose. While we tend to think of nature as being opposed to consciousness or subjectivity, as something which stands over and against and frustrates the soul, the artist takes pieces of nature and compels them to take the stamp of his soul, thereby transforming them into something of human significance. To fully appreciate Crowley's statement on painting in particular, and art generally, it helps to situate it within the context of the larger argument he is making in this chapter. Chapter 20 of Magic and Theory and Practice is, on the face of it, quite odd. After a discussion of the fundamentals of Eucharistic magic, Crowley veers off into an at times sprawling discussion of alchemy and how it relates to topics as diverse as initiation, talismanic magic, conjuration, and the production of the elixir of life, before returning at the end to the subject of different kinds of Eucharist. But what makes this chapter so important, not just for the question of how Crowley viewed art, but also for his views on spirituality in general, is that Crowley believed all these diverse fields shared an underlying structure 
as human activities. The key to understanding this chapter is to understand what that underlying structure is. That underlying structure will illuminate the essence of art from Crowley's perspective. But because this structure underlies and even defines so many disparate phenomena, all of them essential to the project practice of thelemic magic, elucidating this structure will also reveal critical insights into the essence of the thelemic spiritual path. After surveying several disparate ideas from the alchemical tradition, Crowley offers us this summary. Yet beneath this diversity, we may perceive an obscure identity. They all begin with a substance in nature which is described as existing almost everywhere and as universally esteemed of no value. The alchemist is in all cases to take this substance and to subject it to a series of operations. By so doing, he obtains his product. This product, however named or described, is always a substance which represents the truth or perfection of the original first matter, and its qualities are invariably such as pertain to a living being, not to an inanimate mass. In a word, the alchemist is to take a dead thing, impure, valueless, and powerless, and transform it into a live thing, active, invaluable, and thaumaturgic. According to Crowley, the essence underlying this apparent diversity of alchemical techniques is the taking of some first matter, which is an ordinary, inanimate object, and running it through some process, after which is revealed some truth or perfection which was imminent or implicit within the first matter. In other words, the outward appearance of the first matter, what it originally presented as evidence to the senses, belied what the first matter truly was. While the first matter at first appears dead, impure, valueless, and powerless, it contains implicit within it a dimension of vitality and activity which is revealed and liberated by means of the activity of the alchemical process. But what does Crowley have in mind here when he talks about the difference between something dead and something alive? One of the peculiarities of living beings is that we feel constrained to think of them as integral wholes rather than aggregates or mere collections of parts. If I take a rock and split it in half, I end up with two rocks. If I do that with a cat, I do not end up with two cats. Living beings demand we respect their wholeness, their integrity, if we are to continue to regard them as alive. Of course, fields like biology and medicine are premised upon our ability to understand living beings mechanistically. In other words, we understand them by breaking them down into pieces, understanding how those pieces operate independently, and then understanding how those pieces operate in relation to one another. This is the essence of the atomistic or mechanistic perspective. That being said, from a first-person, subjective point of view, when we encounter a living being, we feel compelled not to treat it as a mere heap of parts, but rather to regard it as a unity. And we regard the wholeness or unity of the being as somehow being prior to its parts in terms of importance. We think of the parts as expressing the unity of the being. Remarking on how differently our attitudes often seem toward a stone versus a fly, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein remarks, Look at a stone and imagine it having sensations. One says to oneself, How could one so much as get the idea of ascribing a sensation to a thing? One might as well ascribe it to a number. 
and now look at a wriggling fly, and at once these difficulties vanish, and pain seems able to get a foothold here, where before everything was, so to speak, too smooth for it. And so, too, a corpse seems to us quite inaccessible to pain. Our attitude to what is alive and to what is dead is not the same. All our reactions are different. Realizing something is alive rather than dead provides an entire orientation for how to think about that thing and how to relate to it. The experience of something being alive provides a foothold for the application of other concepts. This is precisely what we expect from a conceptual orientation or a conceptual framework. It is a way of looking that, in turn, determines further ways of looking at something. We feel that there is a fundamental difference between the concept of aliveness and other concepts. It would be odd to say, Jeff is six feet tall, has brown hair, lives in Missouri, is alive, and works as an engineer. Being alive is not just another concept alongside other concepts, but rather determines how we're going to use other concepts to think about Jeff. If I told you Jeff fell out of a 10-story window and landed in the street below, the story would have a much different impact if I told you he had already been dead for two days. Whether something is alive or dead tends to determine our entire attitude toward it. But as we will see shortly, this distinction and transformation between the living and the dead is at the heart of all these related forms of magic, including art production. Crowley goes on to compare alchemy with initiation, finding the structure of the former in the latter. The reader of this book will surely find in this a most striking analogy with what we have already said of the processes of magic. What, by our definition, is initiation? The first matter is a man, that is to say, a perishable parasite bread of the earth's crust, crawling irritably upon it for a span, and at last returning to the dirt whence he sprang. The process of initiation consists in removing his impurities, and finding in his true self an immortal intelligence to whom, man, who, to whom matter is no more than the means of manifestation. The initiate is eternally individual. He is ineffable, incorruptible, immune from everything. He possesses infinite wisdom and infinite power in himself. In the case of alchemy, the first matter was presumably some inert clod of earth or one of the base metals. By means of the alchemical process, some vital presumably solar quality, was revealed to lie hidden at the heart of it. In the case of an initiate, the first matter is a human being in their natural state, which Crowley describes as a perishable parasite crawling irritably for a span upon the surface of the earth. We might, with some justification, also describe such a person as subject to the darkness of matter and the strife of contending forces as described in Libre Libre sub figura 30. Crowley contrasts this natural condition with the condition of the initiate who has found his true self and for whom matter is no more than a means of manifestation. Notice again the contrast between an atomistic and a holistic perspective in this passage. For the initiate, Matter is no more than the means of manifestation of their immortal intelligence. Again, the unity of the whole takes precedence over the parts. The individual is not a mere aggregate of parts or modules. They are, in a sense, greater than the sum of their parts. 
the parts function as vehicles to express the immortal spiritual principle. And therefore, that spiritual principle has metaphysical priority. This notion of an individual's unity preceding the parts, which Crowley refers to as true will, is central to Thelema. And realizing and living in accordance with this principle is central to walking Thelema as a spiritual path. As Crowley summarizes the issue in Liber Sum, the adept must accept every spirit, every spell, every scourge as part of his environment and make them all subject to himself. That is, consider them as contributory causes of himself. They have made him what he is. They correspond exactly to his own faculties. They are all, ultimately, of, e ultimately, of equal importance. The fact that he is what he is proves that each item is equilibrated. The impact of each new impression affects the entire system in due measure. He must therefore realize that every event is subject to him. It occurs because he had need of it. Iron rusts because the molecules demand oxygen for the satisfaction of their tendencies. They do not crave hydrogen, Therefore, combination with that gas is an event which does not happen. All experiences contribute to make us complete in ourselves. We feel ourselves subject to them so long as we fail to recognize this. When we do, we perceive that they are subject to us. We saw in the case of alchemy that in order for a being to be alive, it had to maintain unity in the face of physical or biological change. The aliveness of a being had less to do with the parts composing it and more how those parts related to one another in service to that higher unity. True self or true will is the subjective correlate of this. We might think of it as the feeling of being alive as complementing the objective fact of it. The feeling arises when we learn to view the events of our lives, not as circumstances impinging upon us and determining us, but rather as expressing the higher unity defining our true selves. To live life in accordance with true will, therefore, is not one decision among others, but rather consists in the application of a framework which tells us how to interpret all our other decisions. In this way, it is analogous to the shift in perspective we saw earlier when we transitioned from viewing something as dead to viewing it as alive. Crowley's analyses of talismanic magic and evocation are almost identical with what he has said so far about alchemy and initiation, with one small exception. This equation is identical with that of a talisman. The magician takes an idea, purifies it, intensifies it by invoking it into the inspiration of his soul. It is no longer a scrawl scratched on a sheepskin, but a word of truth, imperishable, mighty to prevail throughout the sphere of its import. The evocation of a spirit is precisely similar in essence. The exorcist takes dead material substances of a nature sympathetic to the being whom he intends to invoke. He banishes all impurities therefrom, prevents all interference therewith, and proceeds to give life to the subtle substance thus prepared by instilling his soul. When we were examining alchemy and initiation, we saw that they should be understood as isolating and liberating a vital potential implicit within the first matter itself. In other words, the alchemist initiator was not getting anything out of the first matter or candidate which wasn't already there. As Crowley has said, there is an obvious condition which limits our proposed operations. This is that, 
as the formula of any work affects the extraction and visualization of the truth from any first matter, the stone or elixir which results from our labels, labors will be the pure and perfect individual originally inherent in the substance chosen and nothing else. The most skillful gardener cannot produce lilies from the wild rose. His roses will always be roses. However, he have perfected the properties of this stock. Alchemy and initiation are about the extraction and visualization of a latent potency within the first matter. It is a making visible of the invisible in ordinary matter. In the cases of talismans and evocations, however, we see a slightly different structure. Now the operator is invoking or instilling the inspiration of his soul into the material substratum. Indeed, we saw Crowley make a similar remark earlier with regard to painting, where the materials, quote, take the stamp of the artist's soul. We can deal with such a contradiction in one of two ways. We can regard it either as a mistake on the part of the author, the result of sloppy thinking, or we can view the contradiction as symptomatic of a tension within the subject matter itself. The first is an analytical method, the second a dialectical method of treating contradiction. I will choose to treat this contradiction using the latter method, though my account will come later when I turn to the issue of authorship. As far as Eucharistic magic goes, Crowley regards it as a subset of alchemy. The Eucharist with which this chapter is properly preoccupied must be conceived as one case, as the critical case, of the art of the alchemist. As such, its structure is identical with that of alchemy. By means of magical operation, the divine essence originally inherent in the substance chosen and nothing else will be brought forth. For this reason, the final result of the Eucharistic operation will depend upon the substance or substances started with. As Crowley says, according to the nature of the sacrament, so will its results be. In some one may receive a mystic grace, culminating in samadhi, and others a simpler and more material benefit may be obtained. As near as possible, one ought to, as Crowley says, take a substance symbolic of the whole course of nature, make it God, and consume it. So, for example, in the Gnostic Mass, each Eucharistic element, bread and wine, represents a complete, complementary cycle of the natural process. Bread sustains the exercise of labor, and labor in turn produces bread. Wine inspires labor, and labor in turn finds solace in intoxication with wine. The closer this substance is to representing the whole course of nature, the more universal will be the sense of God drawn forth from it. For this reason, the ideal Eucharist is what Crowley refers to as the Eucharist of one element. As he says, the highest form of the Eucharist is that in which the element consecrated is one. It is one substance and not two, not living and not dead, neither liquid nor solid, neither hot nor cold, neither male nor female. This sacrament is secret in every respect. The highest sacrament, that of one element, is universal in its operation. According to the declared purpose of the work, so will the result be. It is the universal key of all magic. As the substance started with already presents a unity of opposites, so too will the divinity purified and brought forth from it, presumably the holy guardian angel, have a universal character. This helps make sense of Crowley's claim in this chapter that, quote, to a magician thus renewed by Eucharistic magic, the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel becomes an inevitable task. In the same chapter, Crowley speaks of the medicine of metals, or the elixir of life, in similar terms. 
the universal medicine will be a menstruum of such subtlety as to be able to penetrate all matter and transmute it in the sense of its own tendency, while of such impartial purity as to accept perfectly the impression of the will of the alchemist. This substance, properly prepared and properly charged, is able to perform all things soever that are physically possible, within the limits of the proportions of its momentum to the inertia of the object to which it is applied. Of course, the production of the medicine of metals is the supreme secret kept within the sanctuary of the Gnosis of O.T.O. It is a universal substance which can be molded by the magician into any state of affairs whatsoever. As Crowley says in the Manifesto of the O.T.O., O.T.O. possesses the secret of the Stone of the Wise, of the elixir of immortality, and of the universal medicine. But the universality of this magical force owes to the universality of the first matter from which the operation starts, same as in any other alchemical operation. So far we have seen that art production, alchemy, initiation, talismanic magic, and evocation all share the same basic underlying structure and operate according to the same principles. All of them have to do with the creation of a living thing from a dead thing. And in each case, the operator is not able to bring forth any truth from the first matter, which was not already implicit within it. In other words, the nature of the first matter is only brought forth and made visible by the operator not created in it. Furthermore, we have also seen that this very same structure is implicated in the main work of both AA and OTO. Initiation is the main concern of the work of AA, and the production of the universal medicine, or Eucharist of one element, is the main concern of OTO. So not only is this structure essential to virtually all forms of Thelemic magic, it must be important to an understanding of Thelemic spirituality generally for it to lie so close to the heart of both of Crowley's lifelong spiritual projects. Finally, the fact that this structure is also shared by art production means that, far from being a mere peripheral matter, art production actually has an important, even essential relationship with Thelemic spirituality. But what precisely is the nature of this structure? What exactly does it mean to transform a dead thing into a living thing? How is this done? And what does it mean exactly that the issue of life and death lies at the heart of Thelemic spirituality? What does that imply about the essence of the Thelemic spiritual path? Before turning to the dark star around which all these issues revolve, I want to circle back on art production and draw out some of the implications laying on the table so far. Leaving aside for a moment what we saw in talisman production and evocation, what we saw in the cases of the first matter of alchemy the candidate for initiation, and the substrate of Eucharistic magic is that the final result depends almost entirely on the implicit nature of the first matter. The alchemical process, the initiation process, and the Eucharistic process only have the power to make explicit what was lying in wait as potential in the first matter. The job of the operator is not to impose something divine on matter from the outside, but rather to transform the first matter in such a way as to reveal what the first matter was truly all along. If we apply this same logic to art production, we get the notion of medium specificity. Medium specificity is the idea that there are inherent qualities specific to each different artistic medium. And the function of the artist is to reveal and bring these inherent qualities into relief in the work of art. Medium specificity is often contrasted with representationalism, 
or the idea that the work of art is representing some state of affairs in the world. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing is considered to have invented the notion of medium specificity in the 18th century, but its most famous proponent was the 20th century art critic Clement Greenberg. As Greenberg says in his essay, Modern is Painting, it quickly emerged that the unique and proper area of competence of each art coincided with all that was unique in the nature of its medium. The task of self-criticism became to eliminate from the specific effects of each art any and every effect that might conceivably be borrowed from or by the medium of any other art. Thus would each art be rendered pure, and in its purity, find the guarantee of its standards of quality as well of us, as of its independence. Purity meant self-definition, and the enterprise of self-criticism in the arts became one of self-definition with a vengeance. If it were possible to speak of an artistic medium having its own true self or true will, that would be its specificity as a medium. When an individual is following their true will, events do not happen to them. Every single interaction with anything whatsoever is seen as an expression of self or will. Similarly, in the case of an artistic medium, it's no longer about anything external to the medium itself. The job of the artist is to allow the medium to express itself and its own potencies. Medium specificity is a way of looking at artistic medium which is conducive to abstract, non-representational art. As Greenberg said, to achieve autonomy, painting has had above all to divest itself of everything it might share with sculpture, and it is in its effort to do this, and not so much, I repeat, to exclude the representational or literary, that painting has made itself abstract. Aside from being a lifelong poet, essayist, and prose writer, Crowley himself became a painter in his 40s and exhibited his work in Berlin in the 1930s. Crowley was by no means an abstract expressionist. His paintings have been favorably compared with German expressionists like Ernst Kirchner. But while medium specificity as an account of art production is probably most at home with abstract expressionism, Greenberg identifies it as a trend that defines most modernist painting. It involves a movement away from what we might think of as an accurate three-dimensional portrayal of objects in space, and more toward an approach that emphasizes the flatness of the canvas. I don't believe Crowley painted the way he did because of some particular notion of the medium he had. I think he was probably imitating Paul Gauguin, as in his poetry he tends at first to imitate Shelley and Baudelaire. But Crowley's own paintings fit pretty clearly within that trend of abstraction and medium specificity, just as his writing fits modernist trends as well. The spiritual and magical importance of medium specificity is that it is about giving intrinsic meaning, what Crowley might have called vitality, back to matter. Take a force of nature like gravity, for example. We don't think of there being anything particularly numinous about the fact that objects, when released, fall to the earth. The ancients didn't view things that way at all, though. The fact that something fell to the earth when released said something important about its intrinsic nature as compared with fire or air, or for that matter, as compared with the planets, which they viewed as divinities. For us, the fact of something falling to the earth has been demystified, demythologized. It's been rendered a dead, merely mechanical result, expressible as an abstract equation. But in the context of Jackson Pollock's drip paintings, gravity comes into play as an essential factor. He's standing over the canvas and letting the drops and streaks just fall onto it but it's no longer showing up just as a lifeless mechanical function. It is revealing itself as a vehicle of human expression. It is turning up as an artistic medium. It's no longer something that just exists alongside other things. 
it enters into partnership with our desire, thereby allowing us to feel at home in the world. It is, in a sense, re-enchanted for a moment in the context of our aesthetic appreciation. The same could be said for other dimensions of paint. As Frida Harris said, My gods have no human forms, only curves, angles, and light, movement, color, sound. Sensuous qualities, shapes, lines, movements, forms, things we would normally think of as mere lifeless data of the senses, invigorate the imagination and show up as living, even divine beings. This has implications for the function of the artist. Medium specificity implies that there is a certain will on the side of the artistic medium, be it paint, sound, film, stone, plastic, language, etc. It is not simply the will of the artist which is coming out in the final work of art. Even in the case of Expressionism, the type of painting Crowley did, there is a particular meaning which is being delivered by means of the work of art which cannot be clearly attributed either to objective reality or even the inner state of the artist. Every work of art has dual authorship. There is the intention of the artist brings to the medium, that which they seek to express through the medium, and then there is the truth implicit within the medium itself which is seeking its own expression. Even in writing this talk, language is not appearing to me as a transparent, obedient vehicle of my commands or thoughts. I have some urge, some idea, however inchoate. I set out to write it, and the final result is not just of me, but rather expresses a partnership between some felt life within me and some life I feel pushing myself up against in the form of language. It is not my confrontation with nature we are experiencing, but rather nature's confrontation with itself, resulting in words which in some sense represent objective states of affair, but which also must be seen in their magical aspect, as incantations meant to evoke images and thoughts in your mind, the way a magical operator, standing in a circle, evokes a spirit into a triangle. This is why the ambiguity Crowley leaves between imprinting one's soul on an object, as in talismanic magic or painting, versus realizing some, in some truth implicit in the first matter is not a mistake. It is exactly correct. It is the line between the will inherent in ourselves and the will inherent in nature which is effaced through magical creation. The greater the work of art, the more impossible it is for the artist to sign it. Every great artist is Nemo. Having explored art production and art medium in light of the principle Crowley identifies at the root of alchemy, I would now like to return to that principle and consider it more abstractly. As I mentioned before, the fact that this structural principle underlies most forms of thalamic magic, as well as the central mysteries of AA and OTO, makes it worthy of special consideration. In all the cases we have looked at thus far, we are subjecting some first matter to a process whereby its implicit truth is made explicit. The first matter is invariably some natural object, something we find ready-made in nature. But it is not existing according to its truth. Its truth is buried or concealed within it. And so whether it appears that way or not, the natural object is really dead, according to Crowley. It is possible for this dead object to become vivified, to experience its own vitality, which really means existing in accordance with its own nature or its own principle. But this requires it to first undergo a process. This process is invariably destructive of the original, outward form of the first matter. In the case of alchemy, it requires the first matter to undergo the negredo, or blackening stage. 
In the case of initiation, it requires one to pass through the dark night of the soul and experience the destruction of separateness in samadhi. In the case of the work of art, matter must be transformed into artistic medium. This three-part structure we have been looking at so far, in which an object in its natural state undergoes a destructive process, only to be reborn in a perfected state, is symbolized by the magical formula E-A-O. Describing this formula in Chapter 5 of Magic and Theory and Practice, Crowley says, This formula is the principal and most characteristic formula of Osiris, of the redemption of mankind. I is Isis, nature, ruined by A, Apophis, the destroyer, and restored to life by the redeemer Osiris. The same idea is expressed by the Rosicrucian formula, of the Trinity. We are born from God. We die in Jesus. We are reborn through the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of resurrection as vulgarly understood is false and absurd. It is not even scriptural. St. Paul does not identify the glorified body which rises with the mortal body which dies. On the contrary, he repeatedly insists on the distinction. The same is true of a magical ceremony. The magician who is destroyed by absorption in the Godhead is really destroyed. The miserable mortal automaton remains in the circle. It is of no more consequence to him than the dust on the floor. But before entering into the details of E-A-O as a magic formula, it should be remarked that it is essentially the formula of yoga or meditation. In fact, of elementary mysticism in all of its branches. EAO was an important formula in the context of the Golden Dawn Adeptus Minor Initiation, where it symbolized a resurrection or a second birth through self sacrifice. In that context, Apophis, also known as Apep, the great serpent and enemy of the sun god Ra, ruins nature. But this ruining is redeemed through the suffering of Osiris, who is seen as isomorphic with Jesus Christ. By sharing in the suffering of Osiris, Jesus Christ, we too can be redeemed and participate in deification. The parallel between this tripartite formula of destruction and resurrection and the process of alchemy was noted by Crowley himself in an adjacent passage. The alchemists themselves taught this same truth. The first matter of the work was base and primitive, though natural. After passing through various stages, the black dragon appeared, but from this arose the pure and perfect gold. However, it must also be noted that Crowley regards this formula of, road of redemption through suffering as abrogate. As we saw above, he regards the doctrine of resurrection itself as absurd, and while he considers the notion of mystical attainment described by E.A.O. as valid so long as it is divorced from the glorification of suffering, it is no longer the supreme attainment. And while the similarity between E.A.O. and the alchemical artistic processes we've been looking at so far is clear, it is also worth noting a key difference. In the E.A.O. formula of the Golden Dawn, Apophis is the destroyer of nature and the enemy of Ra, whose havoc must be redeemed vicariously by means of Osiris. But in the sorts of activities we have been looking at, it is the destructive or transformative process itself which is valorizing the first matter by releasing its truth or perfection from captivity within the blind forces of matter. The alchemist blackens the first matter in order to release gold from it. The candidate brings themselves through the ordeal of initiation in order to reorient themselves toward the immortal part of themselves. The magician conjurer arranges matter so that it can bear the spiritual. The artist transforms mere matter into artistic medium so it can bear and communicate human significance. In all of these cases, the artist magician has taken up the place of Apophis in the operation, not Osiris, and their action does not ruin nature in anything other than a superficial, 
false sense. This has bearing on another doctrine, which has importance both to the Golden Dawn and to Thelema, the doctrine of the Pentagrammaton. The Pentagrammaton, or yod He shin vau He, represents the descent of spirit, represented by the Hebrew letter Sheen, down into the midst of the four elements, represented by yod He vau He. By descending into their midst, spirit redeems the four elements from their fallen blind state. This doctrine of pentagrammaton is connected in Golden Dawn spirituality with the aforementioned doctrine of redemption of ruined existence through suffering and self-sacrifice. The five letters together are pronounced Yeheshua, a reconstructed form of the name Jesus. Not only is this doctrine one rejected by Crowley, but again, it is quite different in kind from the formulae we've been examining so far. In all of these cases, matter is in no way being redeemed by something spiritual injected from outside of it. On the contrary, what we keep seeing over and over again is that there is already a spiritual reality implicit within matter itself in its natural state. What makes the first matter untrue isn't that it is mere matter in some spiritually dejected sense. It's that it either lacks unity or lacks orientation toward the principle of its own unity. That situation is remedied not by bringing in something extra from the outside, but rather, if anything, by taking something away by destroying something in the first matter. This destructive process itself is liberating and making visible the truth implied in the first matter. In the fifth chapter of Magic and Theory and Practice, Crowley offers a reconstruction of EIO that is a much better fit to the processes we have been looking at so far. He refers to that formula as viaov, or u-i-a-o-u. The Master Therion, in the 17th year of the Aeon, has reconstructed the word i-a-o to satisfy the new conditions of magic imposed by progress. The word of the law being Thelema, whose number is 93, this number should be the canon of a corresponding mass. Accordingly, he has expanded E-A-O by treating the O as an ayin and then adding vow as prefix and affix. The full word is then vow, yod, aleph, ayin, vow, whose number is 93. We may analyze this new word in detail and demonstrate that it is a proper hieroglyph of the ritual of self-initiation in this aeon of Horus. Rather than a formula of redemption of destruction through self-sacrifice, the formula of Viaov describes a process of initiation through reduction and reorientation. According to Crowley, the first process of this formula is to find the I in the V, initiation, purification, finding the secret root of oneself, the epicene virgin who is ten, Malkuth, but spelt in full twenty, Jupiter. This is almost exactly the same way Crowley described initiation in chapter 20 when he compared initiation with alchemy. He said, the process of initiation consists in removing his impurities and finding in his true self an immortal intelligence to whom matter is no more than the means of manifestation. This epicene virgin he's referring to is reference to he final of Tetragrammaton, which is also Malkuth. This yod in the virgin expands to the babe in the egg 
by formulating the secret wisdom of truth of Hermes in the silence of the fool. We went from V to I. This was the initial process of initiation and purification. And now we have just transitioned to A. However, A is no longer the ruiner of nature. A no longer represents some condition we need to redeem ourselves from. Rather, A represents the babe in the egg, a symbol Crowley equates with the Egyptian god of silence, Harpocrates. As Crowley says in the Book of Thoth, now consider the traditional form of Harpocrates. He is a babe, that is to say, innocent, and not yet arrived at pre puberty, a simpler form of Parsifal. He is represented as rose pink in color. This babe is in an egg of blue, which is evidently the symbol of the mother. This child has, in a way, not been born. The blue is the blue of space, the egg is sitting upon a lotus, and this lotus grows on the Nile. Now, the lotus is a number symbol of the mother, and the Nile is also a symbol of the father, fertilizing Egypt, the yoni. Harpocrates is an important symbol in Thelema representing, among other things, the secret self or holy guardian angel of each individual. Harpocrates is also the dwarf soul, the secret self of every man, the serpent with the lion's head. But the small person of Hindu mysticism, the dwarf insane yet crafty in many legends in many lands, is also this same holy ghost or silent self of a man or his holy guardian angel. Notice that the connection with the symbol of the serpent has been retained. We saw earlier that Apophis, the destroyer of nature, was the great serpent Apep. Crowley has retained the connection between the A phase of the EAO formula, but now rather than representing a condition which humanity must free itself from through self-sacrifice, the serpent represents the saving power itself. Indeed, the candidate calls upon the serpent Apep as such a power in Liber Pyramidos. Hail, Asi! Hail, Hu Apep! Let the silence speech beget the words against the sons of night. Tahuti speaketh in the light. Knowledge and power, twin warriors shake the invisible, they roll asunder the darkness. Matter shines, a snake. Sebek is smitten by the thunder, the light breaks forth from under. Hippocrates does not only represent the holy guardian angel of each individual, they also represent the preeminent divine reality from which Crowley received the Book of the Law and with it the spiritual path of Thelema. Iwas is called the minister of Horpokrat, the god of silence, for his word is the speech of of silence. Iwas is the representative of the god of silence. His speech, the book of the law, can therefore be thought of as the speech of silence. But Liber Tav tells us what the function of the speech of silence is. It is the path of Peh, the mouth of the beast. It is destruction. This inversion of the symbol of the serpent its transformation from a symbol of evil into a symbol of liberation is one of the core distinctive features of Thelemic spirituality. But this deification of the serpent does not transform it into a force for good. It does not make it a friend. The characteristic mode of behavior of the serpent Apep is still to destroy to poison. Then there was silence. Speech had done with us a while. There is a light so strenuous that it is not perceived as light. Wolfsbane is not so sharp as steel, yet it pierceth the body more subtly. Even as evil kisses corrupt the blood, so do my words devour the spirit of man. I breathe, 
and there is infinite dis-ease in the spirit. As an acid eats into steel, as a cancer that utterly corrupts the body, so am I unto the spirit of man. I shall not rest until I have dissolved it all. Libra 65, chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. To turn toward Thalema and to reorient oneself toward the preeminent spiritual reality it represents means a turning toward darkness, toward one, what one, without any exaggeration, might call the demonic. This turn toward the demonic is borne out in the next step of the via ov process, which takes us from A, or Hippocrates, to O, or Baphomet. Crowley continues, The second main point is the completion of the A, Babe Bacchus, by the O, Pan. He acquires the eye wand, beholding the acting and being adored. The inverted pentagram, Baphomet, the hermaphrodite fully grown, begets himself on himself as V again. Baphomet is, of course, the famous idol allegedly worshipped by the Templars. He is the goat of Mendes, the devil. We have, therefore, no scruple in restoring the devil worship of such ideas as those which the laws of sound and the phenomena of speech and hearing compel us to connect with the group of gods whose names are based upon Shet, or D, vocalized by the free breath A. For these names imply the qualities of courage, frankness, energy, pride, power, and triumph. They are the words which express the creative and paternal will. Thus the devil is Capricornus, the goat who leaps upon the loftiest mountains, the godhead which, if it become manifest in man, makes him Egipan, the all. This treatment of Harpocrates as the silent, menacing prelude to a violent, even demonic explosion of energy occurs elsewhere in Crowley's writings, where he links it with the explosion of true will represented by Rahor Kuit, or Horus. But on his appearing, he assumes the active form twin to Harpocrates, that of Rahor Kuit. The concealed child becomes the conquering child, the armed Horus avenging his father Osiris. So also our own silent self, helpless and witless, hidden within us, will spring forth if we have craft to loose him to the light, spring lustily forward with his cry of battle, the word of our true wills. For two things are done, and a third thing is begun. Isis and Osiris are given over to incest and adultery. Horus leaps up thrice armed from the womb of his mother. Hippocrates, his twin, is hidden within him. Set is his holy covenant that he shall display in the great day of M-A-A-T, that is being interpreted the master of the temple of A-A, whose name is Truth. Libra Aash, verse 7. Following the climactic moment of the Gnostic Mass, in which the priest and priestess together depress the particle of bread into the cup of wine, the priest strikes his breast and three times cries, O lion and O serpent that destroy the destroyer, be mighty among us. The lion serpent he is calling upon is the very same spiritual power we have been contemplating, the very same force 
Hur, Apep, whose poison corrupts and dissolves us utterly. That very same destructive power is now called upon at a crucial moment in the central religious rite of Thelema for the purpose of destroying the destroyer. But who, or what exactly, is the destroyer we are calling upon the lion serpent to destroy? What is the spiritual function of this power of destruction? Why would someone want to submit themselves to being poisoned? How can one make a spiritual path out of embracing darkness? And what does this imply about the function of art and of the artist? I will address these questions now, in the final part of my talk. In chapter 21 of Magic and Theory and Practice, Crowley declares, The devil does not exist. It is a false name invested by the Black Brothers to imply a unity in their ignorant muddle of dispersions. A devil who had unity would be a god. How are we to reconcile such a statement with the rampant devilry we just witnessed in chapter 5? The clue lies in his reference to unity and disunity. As we saw in our discussion of alchemy, the difference between the living and the dead is the difference between what demands we approach it as a unity versus a mere aggregate of parts or pieces. In the case of the initiate, it is all a matter of coming to see the events of one's life, pleasant or unpleasant, boring or difficult, as expressions of that higher unity of the true self and the true will. Being alive is the objective side of what doing one's true will is the subjective correlate. Doing one's will is what it feels like to be alive. But unity is beyond good and evil. It is light, and it is night, and it is that which is beyond them. It is speech, and it is silence, and it is that which is beyond them. It is life, and it is death, and it is that which is beyond them. It is war, and it is peace, and it is that which is beyond them. It is weakness, and it is strength, and it is that which is beyond them. This is true in a lofty metaphysical sense. Kether transcends the duality of Hokma and Binah. Subtle experiences, such as jhana or samadhi, transcend the duality of subject and object. But even the concrete sense in which an organism maintains its unity is beyond good and evil. Arsenic is evil to us because it decomposes the relations of our parts, one to another until our unity is ultimately dissolved and we perish. But from the point of view of arsenic, it is merely declaring its own unity in relation with our bodies, expressing its own intrinsic nature, and therefore it is doing good by killing us. The same could be said for an angry swarm of bees that stings a three-year-old to death. Even a person for whom the expression of their psychopathic tendencies compels them to rape. When Crowley rejects such activities, it's not because he regards the actions themselves as bad in some kind of abstract moral sense. It's not because they violate the supposed divinity of another person. It's because such actions have a tendency to undo the unity of the person committing them. In other words, the person will probably get caught and put to death. Do what thou wilt does allow for the concept of evil. But it is a concept of evil relative to the will of each. 
It is relative to the unity which expresses the true nature of each organism. To be evil means to live in such a way that your own relations decompose. It means the loss of your own unity. By contrast, to be good means to live in accordance with and to express that unity. But you living in accordance with your own unity, your own good, gives no guarantee that, from the perspective of another being, your impact on them is not evil. In fact, you can be certain that there are many perspectives from which the activities of your best divine self are evil. This might seem like a terrible fate. And fate, in the sense that it had for the ancients, is precisely the right term for it. But the truth is that we cause even more mayhem when we do not live in unity with ourselves. The more we concern ourselves with the wills of others, the more damage we do. We become mere aggregates of impulse. Our final decisions are nothing of the kind. They are merely the sums of competing force vectors from within and without and all around us. In Crowley's language, we are like countries divided against ourselves, bodies racked with cancer. From the perspective of our higher selves, we are in a fallen, evil state. This is how Crowley describes the run-of-the-mill human condition. But if we're not living in accordance with our own natures, if we are not organizing according to our own principle of unity, then we are not truly alive. We merely think we are. So many of our decisions are motivated by the fear of death, the desire to avoid death. In reality, the worst thing imaginable has already happened to us. If we had any sense, we wouldn't fear death we would fear never having lived in the first place. When this realization occurs, if it ever occurs, it is accompanied by the feeling of horror. Horror in the sense of revulsion and terror, but also horror like a horror film. What is a monster, really, other than our own repressed natures projected onto a shadow? The monster is the illusion of dead matter erupting with life. It is a false unity grotesquely imposed upon and animating a shadow. Almost the exact terms Crowley used to describe the devil. One of the first horror novels ever written, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, is about exactly the issues we have been exploring this evening. Life, death, and the difference. Horror continues to be about this issue. It presents an image of dark matter pregnant with a coiled serpent about to spring. It is the mere image or illusion of what we in fact are, the walking dead. The reason we require an encounter with darkness is simple. Darkness is the only thing in heaven or in hell that has the power to destroy what we have erected in desperation. There is something here akin to the ancient Gnostic idea that we are spiritual beings trapped in matter that must seek their release. The Gnostic god Chanubis is isomorphic with the lion serpent, the holy guardian angel of Thelemic tradition. But the similarity stops there. 
The purpose of releasing this potential trapped at the heart of disorganized matter is not so it can escape to some remote celestial region. There is no pleroma to retreat to for perfection. What is freed in this world is freed for this world, because it was always of this world. If you want to know what heaven, the body of Nui, looks like, look all around you. When you discover and do your true will, you will do it right here, right now, in this world. And it may very well be destructive of other things in this world. In fact, almost certainly will be at least some of the time. Full consciousness, apprehension, and ownership of one's own vitality requires one to accept this fate. One will probably encounter this fate as darkness outside of oneself. Darkness which one must descend into on a solitary journey to the underworld, to the realm of the dead. If you want the keys to open your prison cell, you need to go to the only person who has them. She is the queen of the dead. Her name is Kore. She is also called Malka, or He Final of Tetragrammaton. Her destiny is Babylon, the mother of us all. She lies at the center of the earth. I do not mean she is at the center of the planet. I mean she is at the heart of all matter. She is everything we have been looking at for the last hour. You can see her and feel her literally anywhere you look, so long as you know how to look. And that is a large part of the spiritual path, learning how to look, learning the proper use of the senses, it is the acquisition of an aesthetic education. After the Greek word for sensation, aesthesis. And so we return to the function of the artist and the spiritual role of the work of art. The artist affects liberation and release of what is spiritual at the heart of matter. The transition from mere matter to artistic medium is the same as the journey of initiation. The artist is the hierophant, and matter is the candidate. If the initiation is successful, the work of art is a window allowing chaos to shimmer through the regular order of being. When we are face to face with great art, whatever the form, we are having a direct experience of that spiritual reality which lies all around us and in us, but which we are not usually able to see or appreciate until we have learned to see with the eyes of a mystic or an artist. Perhaps you have had the experience of finishing a great novel or a great film. Putting the novel down or emerging from the darkness of the theater into the light, you think to yourself, my God, my life has to change somehow. But how? You have no idea. The work of art did not tell you how to change. It's not supposed to. That's not its job. The job of the work of art is to display its own nature to you. It's revealing what lies coiled at the core of itself. 
If it had a voice, it would be asking you to do the same. It is asking you to live in accordance with your own law, to let the chaos within you shine forth. It is demanding you transform your own life into a work of art. May your minds be open unto the light. May your hearts be centers of love. May your bodies be temples of life. Thank you very much for being with me. If you have found this valuable, please consider donating a few dollars via PayPal to horizon at seattle-oto.org. We would very much appreciate your generosity. Love is the law, love under will. Good night.